perhaps you'll remember that time when Molina Srudin was sitting in the coffee shop with his friends. One of his friends said to him, Mola, Mola, why is it that you've never got married? Oh, said the Mola, I was looking for the perfect woman. Well, did you find her, said his friend. Mola said, yes, but first I met a woman who was beautiful, but she wasn't practical. She didn't know the ways of taking care of a house or any of those things. And then I met another woman. She was very beautiful, but she was very worldly. And then I met the perfect woman, perfect in every way. She was beautiful, she was practical, and she knew the ways of spirituality. Well, said his friend, why didn't you marry her? Oh, said the Mullah, it so happened she was looking for the perfect man. <laughs> <laughs> No doubt you remember that story about the time when Confucius was walking along the banks of a river with several of his students, when suddenly they came to a waterfall, tumbling down a cascade, roaring over rocks at the bottom. And Confucius turned to his students and said, nothing could live down there on those rocks with the power of that water. Not even a turtle could survive down there. When suddenly they saw a man going over the cascade, tumbling down and down and over and over, they were horrified. So they decided to dash down and see if they could take his broken body out from the rocks below. But just as they had arrived at the bottom of the waterfall, there was the man walking out, totally unscathed, whistling a song and going off down the road. Well, Confucius hurried over to follow the man and said to him, How did you do that? And the man said, It's very simple. I entered the water at the center of its whirl, and I left it when it whirled the other way. Yes, said the Confucius, I know, I know about that. But tell me, how do you do it? And the man said, well, I was born on the land, so I know the ways of the land. And I lived by a river, so I know the ways of water. I really don't know how it happens, but this is how it is done. So there's no doubt that by now we've learned that the center of the world, of the experiences of life, knowing that everything spins is that silence that we've found that stillness being present but there remains the question knowing that we too know the ways of the land and the ways of water or what they represent. Where do they meet? How is it done? <coughs> Which leads us on from the question, what is our relationship with life now? And then there was 
Confucius. And Confucian, Confucius had just retired from serving at the provincial capital. When one day his leading student, Ameng, came along and found Confucius in a state of depression. So Ameng wanted to cheer up his master. So he began to play his lute and sing. And Confucius said, what makes you so happy? Ameng said, but, but please, Master, t t t tell me why it is you're, you're feeling depressed. And Confucius said, first you tell me what makes you happy. And so Ameng said, well, have you not taught us that happiness is to accept life as it is, to follow the way of heaven, which I suppose in our lingo is to say, going with the flow. Oh, said Confucius, did I really teach you that? You must have misunderstood what I said. Happiness, let me tell you my own experience. I thought that I could wed earth and heaven. But first I needed to learn the ways of earth. And so I did. I studied all the ways of existence. And then I wanted to explore the way of heaven. But in my attempts to do so, I could not find a way or a heaven. Ah, now I know true happiness. But Amen was very confused. And he himself was thrown into a state of depression. So he went home and for seven days and seven nights he found himself in this great state. Abject state. Was it sadness? Was it really a depression? Was it darkness? And then he took his lute and began to play and sing. Yesterday, spending time with our dear friends from Western Australia. The question was asked, and in response was given a metaphor that is sometimes used. And that metaphor is that the mind is like a bird, and all birds need to have a roost on which to come to rest at the baser levels of life. For very many, that roost is a negative one, coming back to a place of failure. I'm no good. What's it all for? And then as we move along a spiritual path, that roost becomes more perhaps refined until we arrive at a place where perhaps we say, it's all God's will. But then even that roost is taken away from us and our bird of mind finds itself unable to rest anywhere. 
no roost, and so it has to flap its wings wildly, as we know with that story of Ram Das being ejected out of Vishnu's mouth, flailing around desperately, and then finding that there is a wind that keeps us aloft, flying seemingly effortlessly. Ah, but then we discover and experience that there is no wind, no heaven, no divine force that keeps us aloft in existence. Where are we then? Where are we then? What is it that happens to our bird when the realization comes that not only does the bird of mind have no roost on which to rest and no wind beneath its wings. Where are we? What happens to our bird? For our bird? What is it that allows Confucius to say now I've found true happiness. Are you still flapping your wings wildly? Believing that there's some force that's keeping you aloft in existence? What is this last illusion of mind?